Hi students and welcome to today's live IELTS class. My name is Adrian and I'm streaming to you live from beautiful Budapest here in Central Europe. I hope everybody is having a great week. This lesson is a listening section. We're going to do a bit of practice to aim for that band nine score. The lesson is brought to you by aehelp.com for academic IELTS. And for the general version, check us out at gielteshelp.com. We will use the academic site for the listening section today in just a moment. If you're searching for our app, look for Academic IELTS Help in your Android or iOS app stores. Look for our Shield. Download, link the app to your web account, and you can learn from either the app or the web page from the same account. It's a pretty cool system. Check it out. Uh, you can always send me an email if you have questions, Adrian. A-D-R-I-A-N at aehelp.com. Listening practice today. Tomorrow, members, we will finish the task two that we started in the previous class, and then we'll do sections three and four for the listening uh, tomorrow at the same time as well. And now let's start off with listening section one. So uh, for this, this is coming from test two, book one of our exams. Uh, while we do this listening, uh, please write your answers into a separate document or piece of paper, not in the chat. Give everybody a fair chance. Don't mislead them with wrong answers. We will go through the listening answers after together. So while you listen, answer on a separate page. Be active, visualize what you hear, go with the flow. Uh, volume is max on my end, so if it's quiet for you, uh, turn up the volume on your side and, uh, of course, use a headset if possible, if you have one available. So uh, let's jump over to our academic website here. We log in to our My Student account. And then in the My Student account, there's the audio CDs. Since this is test two, we're looking for CD two, section one. All right, everyone, so here we go. Three, two, one, get ready for this. Focus. This recording is copyrighted by Two Think One Solutions, Inc and World ESL Teachers. You will hear several different... This recording is copyrighted by Two Think One Solutions, Inc. and World ESL Tutors. You will hear several different recordings and you will answer questions on what you hear. There will be time given to read the instructions and questions and you will be given a chance to check your work. The recordings will be played only once. The test is made up of four sections. At the end of the test, you will have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Listening section one. You will hear a conversation between two women as one of the women registers her daughter for nursery school. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. You will see that there is an example. This time only, the conversation relating to this question will be played. Good afternoon, Monterey Primary, Jane speaking. Hello, my name is Diane Johnson. I was hoping to register my daughter for nursery school at Monterey Primary. Of course, Miss Johnson. Would you like to register your daughter for full day nursery school or half day or full day plus after school care? Oh, just the half day. I don't think Matilda could handle a full day away from home just yet. 
The woman says she would like to register her daughter for half day nursery school. So A has been indicated for you. Now we begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good afternoon, Monterey Primary, Jane speaking. Hello, my name is Diane Johnson. I was hoping to register my daughter for nursery school at Monterey Primary. Of course, Miss Johnson. Would you like to register your daughter for full day nursery school or half day or full day plus after school care? Oh, just the half day. I don't think Matilda could handle a full day away from home just yet. So your daughter's name is Matilda Johnson? Yes, let me spell it for you. The first name is Matilda, M-A-T-I-L-D-A, -A, and the last name is Johnson, but it's not the common spelling. It's spelt J-O-N-S-S-O-N. My husband is Swedish, which explains the different spelling. Right, and what is Matilda's date of birth? She was born December 25th, 2006. So she was born at Christmas. That is incredible. Yes, she was an incredible present to get for Christmas. It certainly was the most memorable Christmas I've had. Yes, I would imagine. OK, so now I need Matilda's personal education number, which she should have received in the post recently. I don't remember receiving such a letter in the post. It would have come from the Department of Education and they always post things in yellow envelopes. You don't remember seeing a yellow envelope in the post? In fact, I do, but I didn't open it. My husband did. He didn't mention anything about a personal education number. Now he's away with work and I won't be able to reach him. Well, we can retrieve the number. I'm going to need your national insurance number as well as your husband's. I'm going to need your husband's name as well. My husband's name is Eric, with a K instead of a C on the end. His last name is Johnson, of course. His national insurance number is DF9877. 45W and mine is KL409115N. Mm. You now have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen to the rest of the interview and answer questions 6 to 10. Right, OK, let me see here. All right, here is a personal education number. I'll give it to you now so that you can write it down for future reference. It is T56340192. Just to make sure, the first character is T as in Thomas. Yes, and this letter in front of the number shows what region the child is originally from. The T in this case refers to Tyne and Weir. That would be correct, I'd imagine. Matilda was born in Newcastle, which of course is in Tyne and Weir. OK, so we have all the information about Matilda that we need. She is now registered for half-day nursery school in September. Do you have any questions? Yes, I do. I was wondering what sort of training your nursery school teachers have. That is a very good question. Each of our teachers has, at a minimum, a two-year diploma in early childhood education. Many of our senior staff have bachelor's degrees in education in addition to the two-year diploma and our departmental head, Miss Janet Roth, has a postgraduate certificate, bachelor's degree and diploma. Do not worry, Miss Johnson, your daughter Matilda is in very good hands. That makes me feel a lot better. Can you tell me when the first day of school is and also will there be an orientation day for new students and parents? The first day of class is the 5th of September and yes, we do have an orientation day. It takes place on the 3rd of September from 9 to midday. Parents and children are strongly encouraged to attend. That is the end of section one. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. All right, students, and always use that half minute to check your answers. Just gonna pause the audio and then we will go through the answers together. Now, uh, students, you probably saw me moving around at the beginning of the audio when the instructions were happening. In the paper-based exam, you may often have a chance to uh, check the topics of the other sections while that's going on. 
If the examiner tells you to please turn back to page one, then do so, but there's no strict rule that you cannot flip to the other pages in the listening section. So keep that in mind. Uh, in the computer-based version, you might not have that opportunity. Um, all right. Uh, notice also, somebody asked, uh, how do I uh, uh, solve these longer multiple choice questions? Um, the ones that are, can be especially tricky are the multi-answer multiple choice. So which three pieces of information are required? As soon as I saw this kind of question where you have this big capitalized three pieces, so you have to choose more than one, uh, spend a little bit more time to review these questions. So notice that there's two personal insurance numbers, there's two national insurance numbers, and so on. Okay, so spend a bit more time with these. All right, um, the listening section, uh, of course, the speakers are native British speakers often, sometimes Canadian, sometimes New Zealand, Australian accents as well. So be ready for that. Uh, this is not an English learning audio. So that means that the speed of the conversations and the lectures are absolutely natural in all four sections. They do not speak slower to help you understand, okay? Um, it goes at a very natural pace. Okay, here we go. So uh, for section one, we get this example. It's the only section where we have an example. This is when you need to focus and review all of the questions. Uh, question number one, what is the woman's husband's nationality? So is it A, Swiss, which is from Switzerland, B, Swedish, from Sweden, or C, Swazi? So uh, which one is it? Amarjeet says B. Awaz agrees, and most students agree that the man is Swedish. Yeah, that's repeated a few times when they're talking about the names. So the man is Swedish, so B is the correct answer. Use the capital letter, the big letter B, when you're doing this. Good job, Hikmatillo Amarwadi, for getting that correct. Uh, number two, how is a child's personal education number normally received? Now, this one, the woman re uh, repeats a couple of times. Um, is it by post, by email, or picked up from the school? Amina, Awaz, Minaj, Amarjeet, and many others agree that the answer is A. Yeah, she said, I would have sent it by the post. It's a yellow envelope, so A is the correct answer in this case. Absolutely, yeah. So Swedish, B, and by post, A. Okay. Next question, another multiple choice. Uh, why is the husband out of town? So he's away with, the woman says this very clearly. Uh, is it for vacation, work, or family reasons? The answer is B. Now, if you miss this, some of you are saying, well, the audio is really fast. Uh, here, the woman is talking about nursery school. She's registering her daughter for nursery school. Logically, um, if uh, the woman is at her residence dealing with nursery school registration, it's probably not likely that the husband flew away on vacation by himself without his family. And if he left for family reasons, his wife and child might probably go with him. So work would be your logical guess here anyway. So B is the correct answer. Uh, students, remember to use logic. Logic in a listening section can help you to save scores. So don't panic. Instead, use logic, okay? That's a really important tip that I'm going to uh, spell out for you. And uh, I really, really hope that uh, you will keep this in mind if you feel like you get into a difficult situation on the reading section, or sorry, in the listening section. So tip, okay, if you feel like 
you are about to panic in the listening section. Instead, think logic. Logic can really save your answers. Okay? So keep that in mind. All right, question number four. So this was the multi, multiple choice uh, question. Which three pieces of information are required to retrieve the child's uh, personal education number? Uh, A, the woman's personal insurance number, the husband's personal. C, the woman's national insurance number. D, the husband's national or E, the woman's name, uh, F, the husband's name. So is it A, B, C, D, E, or F in this case? Which three? Okay, which three? So Awaz says uh, A, F, and B. Uh, Ame Thadok says C, D, and F. Okay. Shang Hung says C, D, and E. Um, okay. So we need C, D, and F. Okay. Again, logic. So pay careful attention. Personal insurance number, that's your private insurance. Uh, if harm comes to you, then uh, uh, medical bills are paid or in case of tragedy, death, then the loved ones may be paid a compensation. So a school wouldn't need a personal insurance number for registration. That's just kind of weird. Again, if you think logic, it makes sense that a school would need a national insurance number, not a personal insurance number. Okay. And uh, the woman is talking with the administrator, the mom. So the administrator and the mom, they introduced themselves to each other. So at the beginning, so that's not likely. Who's absent? Who's not there? It's the husband. The husband's not there. So again, guessing it would make sense that it's the husband's name that's still missing from the information. So just really reiterating that concept of logic, okay? If you forget logic, you can get yourself into trouble. If you remember logic, then it will work. Sugandika uh, kare, you do not need to have the correct order. So you could go D, F, and uh, C in your answer sheet. Okay, it doesn't matter the order. You just need these three pieces. Now, because it's one question, it's just question number four, you need to have all three of these correct to get the full point, okay? If you get one wrong, it means you get question number four wrong. So this is just one question that needs three letters, okay? This just goes into one space in your answer sheet. Always pay careful attention to the number of questions involved, okay? It's very important. All right, so logic, paying attention. Uh, question number five, sorry, I was a little bit late getting to this one. It's one more multiple choice about the spelling of the man's name. So how is the man's name spelt? Is it... Eric CK or Eric with a C or Eric with a K. So what do you think? How would a Swedish person spell the name Eric in this case? A, B, or C. Uh, B would be the British, okay? So keep in mind, students, that C as a K sound, that's very English. 
In most languages, C's are not pronounced as K's. Uh, English is quite unique that way that the C is pronounced as a K. Now remember that the man is Swedish. So again, if you're using logic, you would probably go, okay, if he's not British, if he's Swedish, he's probably spelling his name with a K because in most languages you need a K for the K sound, Eric, K, right? So again, logic can really get you far. Believe you me. So the correct answer here is C, okay? Eric with a K. Because the man is Swedish, Eric with a C would be very British. That would be a very English way to spell the name. Okay. All right. So here we have some dictation. This is coming after a short break. Um, when you're reviewing these questions, of course, you pay attention that the differences in this multiple choice are here and here. Okay. Uh, what is the correct personal education number for Matilda? Yeah, it's A. So it's T56340192. It's A. Okay. It's not with a P, and it's definitely not with a P here because the uh, woman asks, is that first one a T or a P? And then the administrator says T, like in Thomas. And you don't hear any other letter in there, okay? Uh, where was the child born? A, Newcastle, B, London, C, Monterey. Where was this child born? Yes, Samandeep, you're right. It is A, the child is born in Newcastle. So A and A. Tynan Weir, I believe, is what the woman says. Ah, that's correct. Uh, Matilda was born in Newcastle, so A is the correct answer there. All right, let's keep going. Number eight, so again we have another question where you're required two uh, choices from the possible six. Again, in your review time, spend a little bit more on these because they require more thinking. You have to pay attention to more audio. So what two qualifications do many of the uh, nursery school's senior staff have? One-year diploma, two-year diploma, three-year diploma, master's degree, bachelor's degree, doctorate degree. So what are the answers? You need two of them. Many of you are answering B and E, so two-year diploma and a bachelor's degree, and those are correct. So again, in your uh, answer booklet number eight, the order does not matter. You could have E and then B like that. Uh, use capital letters for these so it's very clear, okay? Don't do like a weird little scribble like this, like what is that, an E or an S or what? So just be careful, okay? Uh, capital letters for multiple choice, that's very, very clear. Yes, two-year diploma, bachelor's degree. That makes sense. That's what they have. Okay, and then nine and ten, a little bit of a uh, short answer. Um, no more than two words. Always pay attention to the instructions. Uh, first day of class. When is the first day of class? Okay, uh, K. Moria says it's the 5th of September. Arwen says 5 September. Uh, Arif, you're missing the word September. Uh, Amarjeet says it's 5 Sep. Yeah, um, usually we abbreviate September with a T. So uh, 5 of September, like that. Um, September is one of those funky ones that's usually abbreviated with a T. I do believe that you can do it like that, but I'd have to check. Uh, maybe uh, Google that one. Okay. Um, every time I've seen September uh, abbreviated, it's with a T. It's an interesting one. Uh, most other months are just the first three letters, like January, December, uh, f uh, February. Uh, however, September is the one unique one 
where we actually take the first four letters of the month instead of the first three in most cases, okay? So yeah, I believe that this is okay, but most commonly you'll see it with a T, interestingly, okay? All right, so uh, that's the easiest. You do not need the TH for fifth, okay? So five sept or five sep. I think some of you are Googling and saying that, yeah, it's okay, all right? Okay, um, next question. So next one. Orientation hours, nine to midday. Uh, this one here, number 10, uh, Tunde Adeyemi says parent. Unfortunately, parent is not correct. It has to be parents. So here you need the S, parents, okay? The S is very important. Why? Because children is plural. So parent and children is awkward and incorrect grammar. So you need the S. So Nam, Sherpa, you have to have the S. Pay attention. If this is plural, okay, then this one will also be plural. Okay, so parents and irregular plural children right? Instead of child, children. So it has to be parents. Uh, big P, small P, doesn't matter. Both are okay in this case. It's not a full sentence, so. Or actually it is, sorry, but you don't need the big P. Small P is okay as well. Okay. Uh, Tunde, if you write, that's what I mean. If you write parent um, instead of parents, you'll get it wrong. Okay, has to be plural. So it has to be plural, parents. Okay, now uh, count up your scores. What did you get out of 10? So hopefully you got uh, at least eight or nine. Okay, listening uh, section one is the easiest section. Your goal should be at least eight, minimum eight, hopefully closer to 10. Okay, uh, it's very, very important because the next sections will just be more and more difficult. So if you're going, ha, ah, easy peasy, I got a nine, 10, sweet. Uh, that's good, okay, that's what you need. If you got less than that, if you're getting five, six in section one, it's troublesome because it's just going to get more challenging from here on out, continuing with section two, okay. So section two, let's do it. I hope everybody is ready, steady. Again, write your answers uh, on a separate paper or in a separate document. Don't confuse your fellow students with uh, your answers. And we will share at the end like we just did. We will go over them together. So uh, we'll jump back to the website with our audio. And here we go, students. Get ready for listening section two. Now turn to section two. Take some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Listening section two. You will hear a recording of a university campus tour. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully to the interview and answer questions 11 to 16. Good afternoon, everyone. If you are here for the university campus tour, you are in the correct place. There are two purposes for this tour. For prospective students, you get to see the campus where you may be studying in a few months, and you get to learn some interesting information which may convince you to look favorably on our university. For parents, you get to learn what life is like at this university, so you know where you are sending your kids off to this autumn. Before we start the tour, I'd like to give you some background information. 
This university was originally opened in 1686, although from 1745 to 1805 it was shut down due to a lack of funding. The university is composed of 23 buildings which were built in one of three periods. There were four original buildings in 1686, a dozen more buildings were constructed in the period from 1805 to 1815 and the final seven buildings have been added in the past 10 years. So there is a fascinating mix of 17th century, 19th century and quite modern architecture. The first building we are going to look at is called the Prescott Building, named after the university's first chancellor, William Chester Prescott. As you can probably tell, this is one of the university's original buildings completed in 1686. The building is actually quite unique in shape. It is approximately 40 metres long, while only 8 metres wide. It also has these interesting circular areas attached to each corner, four of them in all. These four circular areas each house a large bell. None of the bells work today, however. As we walk in the door, I'd like to point out all of the beautiful Persian carpets on the floor. These carpets were donated to the university by a former student almost 150 years ago. It is very common for former students who have done well in life to give back to the university. Some give money, some give land, some give gifts such as Persian carpets. One former student even gave the university his pub after he died. By the way, that pub, which is located at the intersection of 3rd Street and Pine Avenue, gives students of the university a 30% discount. Now, if that's not a selling point for this university, I don't know what is. On a serious note, it is our outstanding education which makes our university a top competitor on the global front. You now have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the interview and answer questions 17 to 20. Before we go any further, any questions? No? Right then. Next we are going to visit the University Library. As you see in front of the library, there is a beautiful fountain which shoots water high up in the air. Once again, the funding for the fountain came from a former student. In this case, a well-known artist. It was constructed just 15 years ago at the cost of £50,000. As we step into the library, I think what you'll notice at first is the fact there are no books. Indeed, there are no books at all on the entire ground floor. On the five upper floors, however, there are over three million books. The library's collection has been built over time through private donations, gifts from former students, as well as university purchases. There is also a special collections area where there are original works dating back to the year 1588. Next in our itinerary is a visit to the sporting facilities. Here at the university we have over a dozen different facilities for almost any sport you can imagine, ranging from football and rugby to tennis and squash to archery and cricket. Our rugby team has won the national championship three out of the last five years. As you'll see on your left is a famous wall where we put pictures of... That is the end of section two. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. And again, students, you should always be checking your answers in that half minute, not going on to the next section. All right, so... Let's go through these questions and answers together. So as you can tell, uh, section two, the topic's more specific. They do not repeat the answers as often as in section one. You definitely have to follow even more carefully and quickly uh, with the uh, questions. So here we go, students, section two. It's a university campus tour. Uh, write no more than two words and or a number for each one. 
the university opened. When did the university open for number 11? Uh, Tech Z Nepsen, Omar Wadi, and Andy all agree that it was in 1686. Actually, Omar, it's 86, not 96. So uh, that is the correct answer, 16. 86 that's all you have to write uh, for years often in English we will say the first two numbers together in the second 1686 like that okay uh, pay attention when you have to fill out a table like this with the left and the right columns so university opened 1686 then it gives you the next date 1745 to 1805 it shut down then 1805 to 1815, something buildings were constructed. Uh, number 12, how many buildings were constructed in the 10 years from 1805 to 1815? It's not 23, it's not four. The speaker says there are 23 total, okay? So the first building, we have a number here and then seven buildings. So one building, seven buildings, okay? And there were a dozen, Tex Z Nepson says a dozen. Uh, just make sure that you're spelling dozen correctly. So dozen, a dozen buildings, okay? A uh, dozen means 12. So you can also put the number 12. Both of these will be correct. A dozen or 12? And it's a dozen. A dozen buildings. Okay. So a dozen buildings were constructed in these years. Okay. So that somehow makes 20 and then three additional buildings later on or something like that. Anyway, uh, in the past something years, seven buildings were constructed. So how many years? In the past, how many years for number 13? Seven buildings were constructed. Yeah, past 10 years. And all you need here is the number 10. You have the word years. If you write 10 years in the answer sheet, you'll get that wrong, okay? Because then it's 10 years, years, which is weird. Uh, you have to pay attention to what information is included. Okay, so do not write years, just write 10. All right, very important. Okay, you can write the word 10 as well, T-E-N. The number is a little bit faster, simpler. Definitely won't make mistakes. So use numbers whenever you can. Okay. All right. Number 14, here you had to identify the correct diagram. The Prescott Building, it was the first building constructed when the university opened. Uh, is it A, B, or C? You had to listen carefully and figure out from the information which one it was. Uh, it was B, okay? There are a few pieces of information that tells us it's B. The tour guide says it's a long building, about 40 meters by 8 meters. So you'll notice it's got this odd shape, okay? And then the speaker says the circular towers in each corner. So it's the only one with circles rather than squares. So that's definitely the only one. Notice how here you have squares. Here you have circles, and here you have squares. Again, by deduction, by logic, you can kind of figure that out. Bonus question, students. What are these circles? Now, this is to test your extra level of listening, okay? And to really show how well you can listen in English, I challenge you always to go above and beyond the questions that are being asked. So what are those circles? Uh, Sugandika and Dings and Sahar. Uh, let's put it all together. They're bell towers. Yeah. So they represent bell towers. You know those circular towers where you have a bell 
up in the tower and then ding 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 so it's got four bell towers right bell towers smriti very good yeah all right good now before the break to review the remaining questions we have one more to go number 15 the student is talking about former students who were successful and donated some of their belongings to the university um, and uh, one student donated some persian carpets some beautiful persian rugs how long ago so how many years ago were they donated okay 150 okay you don't need years you don't need years ago if you write years ago you'll get it wrong because it's two words and or a number so if you write 150 then it's correct you don't need years because it's in the question okay so just 150 is enough all right always pay attention to what's included in the questions again very important Number 16, another student donated a pub to the university that's in the near vicinity. Uh, what kind of a discount do students get at this pub? 30%, 40%, or 3%? A, B, or C? Please do not write the number because you'll get it wrong. Uh, the correct answer was A, 30%. Okay. Uh, 40 Probably go out of business if you give university students a 40% discount. Uh, they'll drink all of the profit. And C, 3%, well, that's not really special for anyone, so unlikely, right? Uh, you can write approximately 150, Tanuj. I think that's your question. Yeah, you could write approximately 150, sure. That makes sense because they did say that for the previous one. They'll give it to you. Okay, now here it's a summary completion. So basically, this is an iteration of what the tour guide is saying. You just have to complete the blanks with the correct words. In front of the library, there is a beautiful what? Okay, careful with the spelling, Dinks. Yeah, it's a fountain. Fountain, N-A, very good. Fountain. Make sure you have the correct spelling. So in front of the library, there's a beautiful fountain. Inside the library, the ground floor has how many books? How many books on that ground floor? No books. That's right, no books. It's not none. It's no books. Okay. Uh, careful, none is a noun. Here we're using the adjective. No books, right? So, no books. Uh, the upper floors, however, house over 3 million books. The collection was built by donations, gifts, and university purchases. Additionally, there is a something area. This one was a little bit challenging. Bezawada says special collections. Yeah. In this unique case, collection is plural. You can count it, and it has to be. So special collections. And you need the S to get it correct. So uh, sorry for the bad news, but if you just wrote special collection area, it's not accurate. It's not correct. It is called a special collections uh, area because it's more than one collection. It's kind of a strange one it's not with belonging it's just plural special collections area with works dating back to 1588 there are many sporting facilities including the rugby field which is home to the rugby team which has won three of the past five what what has the rugby team won three of the past five national championships is correct and you should have a capital N. Why? Because it's the name of the championships. So the most accurate way is national championships. If you use small n, small c, 
They might give it to you, but it's a gamble. Okay, um, if it's the name of a tournament, like World Cup Soccer, then World Cup Soccer is like this. Okay, it's with capitals because it's World Cup Soccer. It's the name of the, uh, of the sporting event. Uh, they have one that, which has won three of the past five years. Doesn't make sense. Okay. Um, three of the past five national championships. Three of the past five years of what? No, it doesn't make sense. So national championships is the correct answer. Okay. Pay attention to that. All right, students. So count up your total score for section one, section two. What did you get out of 20? So what's your... What's your score from 20 for section one and section two together? Hikmatillo says 15, that's not bad. Hikmatillo, that should be your minimum for section one and two, okay? Uh, Moria says 16 out of 20, that's okay. 17 out of 20, Leroy, that's good, okay? So if you're somewhere at about 16, then you're doing well. For section one and two, if you have less than 15, okay, so if your score is less than 15, then uh, you need to review and study uh, more because it will be hard to reach a band 6.5 uh, if you're not getting at least 15, 16 for section one and two. Because section three and section four are just going to be more challenging and more uh, students lose scores in section three and four than section one and two for sure. So uh, those students who get 15 from 20 in section one and two, uh, most of the time they're only able to get about 10 from 20 for section three and four and that gives you a total of 25 out of um, 40, and there you're at just a band, I think just a band six or maybe a 6.5. I'd have to check our score calculator, but that's very, very minimum uh, for students who need a band score 6.5 or over. All right, um, so that's it. Again, this listening and six more full practice exams, you can get it from our website along with other goodies like uh, computer-based practice exams, a fully interactive course with strategies, uh, join the premium package at aehelp.com for the general version of the exam. Join us here uh, at gieltshelp.com. Click that big red button, and you can also see uh, over 100 hours of video lessons to help you prepare. Also, spend a couple dollars, save yourself a lot of stress and headache. That's it for today. Students, we will finish with this listening, section three and section four tomorrow, and then we can look at your band scores using our band score calculator. So until then, check out our websites, download our app, Academic IELTS Help. Have an awesome rest of your day. Uh, listen to English and speak English every single day when you're getting ready for the exam. It's very, very important. Consistency and frequency. Much love to all of you. Bye for now.